is on implications, reform, and critiques. We have Dave Fagundes, or how's the, what's the Portuguese pronunciation? Fagundes. Fag we don't know, he doesn't even know how to pronounce his name. We have Chris Sprigman, and we have Jennifer Rothman. And without further ado, take it away. Thanks, uh, it's really good to be here. And uh, thanks to Aaron and Kate for putting together a cool event and to all the other panelists for the really interesting presentations. So uh, this is the general wrap-up panel, which means, Dave, don't talk about just your, yourself and your own work. So here's my deal. I promise to make a general point, but I'm going to do so by way of following up on a project that I did uh, several years ago um, that I think is an object lesson to illustrate that more general point. So the general proposition that I want to make is that uh, the, the stories and the work that we typically see on norm-based systems, and that I mean creativity without law in particular, and also just you know any norm-based stuff, right? Shasta County ranchers, uh, sumo wrestlers, tuna sellers in Tokyo, whatever. Uh, these are generally success stories, right? They are stories about how norm systems emerge and how they maintain themselves. And it's not surprising, because we like happy success stories. And if we're attracted to the idea of studying norms, we probably like, are attracted to telling stories about why they turn up and why they work so well. But what we don't see is uh, the decline, stories about the decline and fall of such systems. Right? And so what I want to claim uh, in this, this uh, short presentation is that while these accounts may not be as intuitively appealing as success stories, I think we can learn at least as much, if not possibly in some ways even more, from stories of the decline and the dissolution of these systems as we can from stories about their emergence and their success. And to illustrate this point, I want to talk about the uh, project I worked on a while ago about um, one such system that appears to have undergone such a dissolution, but one that I think is very interesting and instructive for reasons I'll relate. So uh, it was some years ago that I wrote a paper about roller derby, although um, it wasn't really a paper about roller derby per se. It was actually a paper about how the women who compete in this sport regulate the uniqueness of the pseudonyms under which they compete. So as you can tell from this picture, uh, roller derby is not just your average extracurricular. It's very much a uh, countercultural activity. And being part of it doesn't just mean that you want exercise on the weekends, but also that you know, you are interested in expressing some kind of outsider identity. And one way that that's epitomized in the roller derby context is that the women who skate, and it's, by the way, st not completely, but still almost all women who compete in the sport, um, compete under pseudonyms, right? So these pseudonyms are, are listed here. Ivana Spankin, Gia de los Muertos, uh, Princess Slaya, Babe Ruthless, Misdemeanor, etc. right? There are lots of amusing examples. So one thing I observed when I wrote this paper was it was very important both for professional reasons related to avoiding confusion and for personal reasons related to identity that these women keep their names unique. How do you do that when uh, roller derby was becoming, at the time I researched this paper, a sport that was certainly national, increasingly international, and involved in the high mid four figures of competitors? Uh, well, as it turns out, and this is the main takeaway of the paper, uh, the women who competed in roller derby didn't use trademark to regulate name uniqueness, but rather adverted to something called the master roster, which was a privately created system of law that was organized around a central registry with a registrar who would approve or disapprove certain names based on uh, a pretty elaborate system of norms. Uh, there were ancillary norms about how to adjudicate similar names and how to enforce violations, and this worked pretty well. So the paper was called Talk Derby to Me, and there are a lot of claims, but here are three of them. Uh, briefly, as I mentioned, trademarking names at the time I wrote this paper was relatively, uh, relatively very rare, right? You almost never saw this practice. Uh, the second proposition was that name uniqueness was extremely important to the women who did this for the reasons I've given, and it was largely respected. And then the third point was that the master roster is an effective means of governing derby names. People knew what it was, they followed its rules, and if somebody turned out to have the same name, they respected it. So what I was planning on doing for this talk was just showing up and saying, here's the master roster, here's how it relates to creativity without law. Then about a month ago, I got a weird email. It was an email from a guy who said, hey, I read your paper, which alone is astonishing, right? How often has that ever happened? Um, and I would like for you to help me register my daughter's derby name. And I thought, well, that's weird, because remember proposition number one, nobody trademarks derby names, or it's very rare. So I got into a dialogue with him that made me think, and I'm, I'm still working on this, but I suspect it's increasingly true that the practice of trademarking derby names is much more common. So what I found out is that almost all these propositions have changed substantially and in some cases have ceased to be true completely. So uh, I want to take you through the fall of the master roster in three steps. 
First, trademark. Remember the proposition was people don't trademark derby names. They prefer private law. Now, this is not to say that every roller derby skater now trademarks her name. It's still very much a minority practice. But the point is it has gone from something that is almost unheard of by a handful of skaters to something that is a practice most people are familiar with and that an increasing number of people are doing. Uh, in case uh, you're curious about the reason, my current conjecture, and I need to work more on this, is that roller derby is trending in a more professional direction, going from an informal extracurricular to something people might, might want to make a career out of, either by being a coach or by uh, creating a line of sports gear, or even this sort of you know, pie in the sky aspiration some of them have that maybe one day there will be an ESPN contract. Right? So if you believe that you want to make roller derby your business and not just something for fun, you might be willing to invest the thousand odd dollars it costs, you know, including transaction costs, to get a trademark. But there's another interesting uh, reason I think trademark is increasing that relates to uh, some on a point I'm going to make shortly about increasing tolerance or duplicate names. So one skater said something like this. They said, my two cents is, if you care enough about your derby name, then you can trademark it, like some skaters have. So what she's suggesting is that in a climate of derby names where there's an increasing and probably necessary tolerance for duplicated names, if you're one of the people who loathes the idea of sharing a name, the way you get, you're going to have to do that in the world going forward is to expend the cost on trademark almost as a way of signaling how important name uniqueness is to you. Right? So, so trademarking seems to now operate increasingly as an overlay on a changing conception of what derby names are and how they work. Second thing I was wrong about. Uh, duplication. Uh, so my, my idea then, and I should say, you know, at the time I wrote this paper, it was definitely true that people were completely against name duplication. And the idea that you would use somebody else's derby name was considered something that would get you, like, kicked out of the community. Um, what I'm finding now is that there's a lot more toleration of it. So a skater named Riot said, there's just much more to your identity than a name. And I think that's particularly true with the personalities you find in derby. And she goes on to say, derby is really about the fun. Right? There's far too many peeps with their panties in a bunch over things that have no effect on play whatsoever. I say we put our big girl skates on and skate. Right? So what this suggests is that there's an increasing climate of tolerance for duplication. And that's something that uh, was, was not something I saw you know, four or so years ago, years ago when I finished researching this paper. If there's a reason uh, so far, and I just started looking at this, I think it relates to the increasing number of people who do derby, right? So at the time I finished researching the paper, derby was mainly a, a national phenomenon with some inroads into foreign countries, but it has since then become something that is international. There are very successful derby leagues in continental Europe, Australia, uh, certainly in England, and there's this notion that, two things really, first, the argument that there's a likelihood of confusion between somebody in Peoria and somebody in Tokyo is just untenable, right? So to the extent that confusion's a driver of this, that can't work. But the second point, and this is also important, is that with now names or skaters numbering in the, the low five figures, it's getting to the point where there really aren't any truly unique or clever names that haven't already been taken by somebody else. So people have said, isn't it sort of intrinsically unfair that by virtue of the fact that I started skating in 2013, I can't get a good name, but somebody who started skating in 2005 could, right? So sharing seems like a much more fair approach to derby names. Uh, the outcome, which is kind of interesting, is that there's almost an indifference and even a hostility toward derby names. Somebody recently said, this is Warshark tests, and I should mention, um, derby names are still popular and people like them. It's just there's a sort of emergent ambivalence. So this woman said, all in all, I don't really mind duplicate names. Personally, I think we should all just make a move to use our real names. She goes, don't hate me. So the third proposition is uh, registration. So at the time I wrote the paper, the master roster was getting a little shaky. There was a backlog in registration, but people more or less submitted names, waited to see what the outcome was, and obeyed whatever the registrar said. However, in the intervening time, people have started to speak of the death of the master roster. They literally refer to the, the good old days in 2010 and 11 and 12 when the master roster was working great. But the problem was that as, things, as skaters got into the five figures, having a single registrar individually prove every name just began to be untenable, right? And so backlogs were turning into you know, weeks and months, and then some people weren't getting results at all. But what happened that's kind of interesting is that this led to a change in how people think about uh, the meaning of their names. So at the time I researched this paper, names are very much a matter of 
property style exclusion. If you got property rights in a name, that meant it was yours and other people couldn't use it. What I've been seeing since then, though, is people use names much more as a coordinating device. They might look at the master roster and say, I see somebody else has this similar name, but she's in a different part of the country. I'll send her an email and we'll work something out. Or there's a similar name here. I'll just make sure that I'll use a different name if I skate near her area, right? Um, so I think some people believe that this has changed the way people look at derby names, period. Um, and I think that's probably right. Um, but what's also happened that's interesting is that a, a number of alternate registries have emerged. Some of them have been location specific. For example, there's an Australia registry, there's a continental Europe registry. But the one that I think is the most interesting is Derby Roll Call. So Derby Roll Call is um, a, a registry invented in the early 2004, so very recent, by a Manchester UK skater named Sausage Roller. And it has two important distinctions from the master roster. The first is that uh, it's automated. So you don't have a central registrar who's checking every single name and giving it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. The second thing is it accepts duplicate names. So then what work does it do? It does the work of coordination so that everybody gets to submit and register their name. But if you have submitted your name and somebody else comes along later and submits a similar name, you get an email that says, this person has submitted this name. They live here. This is their contact information. You work things out. So the person who uh, created this is sort of a, a local hero. You can see there's already 15 odd thousand registered names to give an, uh, an indication of how quickly it's grown successful. Um, but the person who uh, people have approved, one skater said, I think Derby has grown too much to be banning duplicate names, but I like the idea of there being a list to check against out of respect for those already putting in the work as it were and not to end up with the same names in neighboring leagues. Right? So this is what I call a move from exclusion to coordination, the way we think about names. So then why did the master roster uh, decline? Well, very briefly, a lot of themes I've already touched on. Part of it is just that as roller derby got bigger, the way the master roster was constructed with a single registrar who had to approve or disapprove every single name began to be untenable. Right? It's just they needed a different model because that wasn't working. It was too much for somebody who was doing this in their spare time. But the other interesting trend is cultural expansion. So when derby began, it was a 100% countercultural sport. If you did derby, that meant that you were deeply involved in a punk camp counterculture. But as it got bigger, it got a lot more heterogeneous. A lot of the people that are involved with derby want to do derby because they want to skate, and they think it's fun, and they want to compete, and they have no interest in the countercultural aspect. So they're saying, look, if I want to do softball or basketball or something like that, I don't need to have a funny name. Why should I have to have a funny name for uh, roller derby? And as a result, there's been a, somewhat of an indifference toward names, and people are more tolerant of duplication. And then the final trend that's increasing and, and interesting, I think, is professionalization. Uh, so derby, th there's at least an aspiration that derby could be something you make a living doing, right? Not necessarily the ESPN contract, which for reasons I won't get into, is I think uh, a, a ludicrous pipe, dr pipe dream at this point, uh, although maybe someday. But it's much more that people say, look, I love derby so much that I think I could be something like a coach, right? I could have my own line of derby gear or something like that. And that could mean one of two things. First, it could mean that you're one of the people who says, I want to be you know, the equivalent of Derek Jeter in roller derby. And Derek Jeter doesn't have a silly nickname right, that he skates, that he performs under. Why should I have to have one? Right? So you may be indifferent to derby, and that may explain part of the fall of the master roster. But the other thing it could mean is that you, know, you, you want to invest so deeply in the community that you're willing to expend the cost to do so. Right? So professionalization could lead to people having a different approach toward derby names for two different reasons. So I promise a big picture takeaway. Um, and, and what the hell is this weird slide? So uh, I actually made this, this uh, slide deck during last week. And it was Halloween, so I wanted to do something sort of spooky. Uh, but in the tarot deck, if you flip over the death card, it sounds like bad news, but it's actually not. Do you know what the bad news card is? The hanged man. That's terrible news, right? But what death actually suggests, the card that is, is rebirth. Something ends, but something else replaces it. So I think there's a facile story of the, the, the decline of the master roster as a failure of informal order. You could say, well, the master roster didn't work, and this means that informal order generally fails. But I think the real story is a story of success. I think the truth of the matter is that the master roster is just a piece of an overall system of informal order that was actually very successful. And that the way I see the overall trend line going is that the informal order that was represented by the master roster was organic enough 
to change as Derby did. And as Derby got bigger and there were more people doing it and their preferences and their conceptions of what it meant to have a certain name changed, then uh, the, mass, the, the, the informality of the system they used to regulate names was organic enough to change along with it. I think it also reflects on a preference for having uh, bottom-up systems of regulation as opposed to top-down command and control. Obviously, Congress was never going to get involved with regulating derby names, um, but there was a central authority, WIFTA, the Women's Flat Track Derby Association, that uh, was always, people were always pressing WIFTA and saying, why don't you regulate derby names, right? Centralization is the thing you're supposed to do, get on this. And they were always very insistent that it wasn't something they wanted to mess with and they left it to be informal. And I think that was a wise move, right? Because as derby changed, Right? The, the, the system of regulation changed along with it. And if they had insisted on the master roster as the sole unique way of regulating derby names, then we'd be stuck with it even though it no longer works. Right? So, uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the takeaway is this, right? So I think uh, the big picture story is, or the, the note is, we see in the context of the literature on informal norms almost exclusively stories about the emergence of informal order and the success of informal order but we don't see very much in the way of the decline and the, the demise and the fall of these systems, right? And so I think the weak version of uh, my thesis in this presentation is we could learn a lot from uh, looking at the decline and fall of these systems, which I think is certainly true, but I wonder if there's even a stronger version of this thesis, which would go something like this. Uh, maybe you can get something even better or more interesting from stories of the decline and fall of these systems, right? Maybe it's a more nuanced story to tell uh, when you have to explain why systems decline and things arise in their place because it's more of a dynamic and less of a static story. Uh, but I think that at the very least there is as much to be learned from stories of decline and fall of informal order as there is from their emergence and success. So that's all I got. Thanks. Okay, so I want to join everybody in thanking Kate and Aaron for having me out here and giving me a chance to talk a bit about the scholarship, which it, it is, is very important to me. It's, it's something that I did early in my career and that I continue to do. So I'm going to go a bit meta in this talk compared to some of the others. I'm not going to talk about any specific um, project, at least not until the end, when I'm going to talk about some research I'm doing now. But I'm going to try to give you a sense of the accomplishments of what my friend and co-author Cal Rostiala and I call the negative space scholarship. So the negative space scholarship. This is an idea that was taken from visual arts. The negative space is the space around an artwork that an artwork possibly could fill but doesn't. And you can think of a lot of this scholarship as describing the space around creativity that legal rules could fill but for some reason <gasps> don't. Either they're absent in whole or in part, usually in part. So. Um, uh, this is very important, as it turns out, for our understanding of the relationship between legal rules, including IP rules, and innovation. I want to talk about that, and then I want to give you a sense of where I think this body of scholarship is going or where it should be going. And I want to say that I'm not just talking to the academics here, but also the lawyers. I'm, I hope I will be able to say some things that will possibly affect how you conceptualize your legal practice if you do IP work. So what exactly is the negative space scholarship? So it's, as you've heard, the study of places where we find a lot of creativity, but where IP is absent in whole or more often in part. Um, in my view, the negative space scholarship has an important place in the study of innovation. It gives us a sense of both the function and the limits of legal rules governing creativity. It shows how creativity can take root in different settings in response to very different legal rules and social norms. It also shows how the legal rules we choose select for specific kinds of creativity, encouraging some sorts of creative work, discouraging others. So the negative space scholarship shows us that IP policy is not just a matter of getting more creativity versus less. In some settings, IP rules seem to have very little effect on creative output. They can, however, have an effect on precisely what sort of creative output we get. Now, I'll come back to that point, but I want to highlight one additional contribution of the negative space scholarship I think is especially important, and, and one that transcends the study of innovation. Legal academics in all fields tend to share one commitment. They agree, for the most part, that law matters. If law didn't matter, they would have chosen to study something else. But some of the negative space scholarship suggests that, at least in specific creative fields, law matters much less than we might think. 
A lot of the scholarship suggests that law sometimes matters, but in ways that are different from what lawyers, although law itself, imagines. So let me give you an example from a pa paper co-authored um, that I co-authored years ago with the University of Virginia's Dotan Oliar. So back in the 1940s and 50s, there was no legal regulation of joke stealing among stand-up comedians, nor was there a strong set of norms against joke stealing. And that changed in the mid to late 1960s when a new generation of comedians changed the medium. The modern comics broke with the one-liner style of comedy built around the joke. And they pioneered a more personal, more character-driven, and often more narrative style. Along with this change in form came a change in rules, not legal rules, but powerful social norms against joke stealing. Why? Well, one can tell a standard law and economic story of the Dempsetsian variety about the emergence of property rules in stand-up comedy at this time. The property itself was becoming more valuable because more investment was required for the production of personalized comedic narrative. And with the rise of the National Comedy Club circuit, the possibility of enforcement arose because comedians were each in each other's company all the time and they could engage in a group project of monitoring. Okay, so fair enough, right? We see the rise of property rights, informal social norms driven property rights, but property rights nonetheless. Fair enough, but what's the takeaway? What's the normative payoff? Comedy moved from a no IP regime to an informal but nonetheless powerful IP regime built around social norms. Did this have a measurable effect on the quantity of material produced? Not that we saw. Did it help to shift the kind of material produced? The case here is stronger. The shift in comedic style was not caused, at least not linearly caused, by the rise of the norm system. But we see some evidence, coming from our interviews with comedians, that the norm system encourages comedians to produce the personalized style, and it has helped to cement that style in place. Now, is this a story of progress? connected to the rise of an IP system? Well, not straightforwardly. The personalized style of comedy that we got as the IP system rose up is much more inventive. But it's also less social. The sort of jokes that comedians told in the 1940s and 1950s are more likely to be retreads of jokes you told before, but they're also more likely to be the kind of jokes you tell to your mom or your friends. So if we think of comedy as an exploratory sort of art, we probably like the norm system. If we think of comedy as a social lubricant, we might not like it. It's not a question of more comedy versus less. It's a question of what we want. And the questions that IP norms raise in the context of stand-up comedy are much more interesting and rich than simply how much comedy we get. They raise questions that a lot of people other than lawyers and economists will have something to say about. What sort of culture do we want? What sort of legal rules or informal norms will get us the kind of culture we want? The negative space scholarship raises these questions again and again, but it does not answer them. It delivers us there. It starts a conversation, one in which legal scholars and economists will likely not have a dominant role. If you think for a moment, it's a bit shocking that the negative space scholarship didn't happen a long time ago. On this side of the Atlantic, at least, IP rights are not considered to be an end in themselves. For the most part, they are merely the means to an end. The end is creativity. So IP law, at least in the States, is the study of inputs and outputs. And everyone who thinks about it for a moment knows that different creative industries face quite different conditions. And so you would have thought that IP scholars would have spent a lot of time on industry studies. And you would have also have thought that some of these studies would not have been limited to industries in which IP plays a major role. You would think that IP scholars would understand that they are really innovation scholars. And that IP is of interest instrumentally and not ultimately. But that was not the dominant view in the field. It wasn't even much of a view at the margins until recently. And this is why IP scholars spent a lot of their time looking at places where IP is, and not a lot of time looking at places where IP isn't. They mistook the means for the end. Perhaps the signal accomplishment of the negative space scholarship has been to put an end to that. So I want to talk a bit about some areas that need to be studied. Someone has to do a good paper on the furniture design and manufacture industry here in the States. Someone has to look at it in contrast to its European counterpart, which enjoys generalized design protection, whereas the US furniture industry, which is very vibrant, does not. And while we're on the subject of Europe, there is an entire vein of scholarship that is waiting to be done on the European design system. A few years ago, Cal Rostial and I were writing our first article on the fashion industry, and we spent a lot of time looking through the EU's registered design database. One thing we noticed at the time is that there are very few high-end fashion designs registered there, 
but there are a surprisingly large number of designs for portable electric generators. Uh, <laughs> the question that occurred to me has a three-letter acronym that involves a curse word, so I'm not going to repeat it here. <laughs> but it did interest me. So I called up a bunch of companies, mostly Japanese, that make these electric generators, and I, I asked them when I, I got to talk to them, well, what's going on here? I, I didn't use the three-letter acronym, but they knew what I meant. And I did manage to talk to a few lawyers about the company, uh, you know, the companies about this, and here's what they told me. It was, it was both surprising and amusing. So the generators, they said, are a mature technology. They all work about the same, and they all work about as well. Without some way to differentiate them, the generators would face very sharp commodity competition. And so the companies invest in design in order to differentiate their products aesthetically. So, so what are we to think about this? It's an interesting story, but I confess I'm not sure what the takeaway is, and someone should do some thinking about this. Some people would look at this and say, well, IP is used to create differentiation, and that's good. It satisfies some preferences, and that's good. Maybe. Others would look at this and say, well, the IP is just used to create silly differentiation. These, these portable generators are not about aesthetics. They're about generating electricity without burning a whole hell of a lot of fuel or making a lot of noise. It's not satisfying preferences. It's just businesses trying to avoid sharp competition and kind of needlessly differentiating so that they can maintain some market power and shift surplus from consumers to producers. The first account sounds like progress. The second account sounds like oligopoly. So which one is it? I hope that someone is going to write an interesting paper about this. It looks to me at least, and at least at this early stage, like the EU has hugely overdone its design protection system. They may be promoting progress in some instances, sometimes. I, I suspect that in a lot of instances, the EU design regime does not promote social welfare. It promotes producer welfare, and that is not the same thing. So I've described a bit of virgin territory, but there is also some territory that is not virgin about which much more could be said. So of course I'm talking about the adult entertainment industry, and I'll warn you that it's impossible to do so without stumbling into at least one double entendre, so bear with me. It so as, so <laughs> it's totally impossible. Uh, so as most of you know, Kate Darling has written the pioneering paper in this area. She looked at the effect of piracy on the industry, and she argued, among other things, that piracy has led to a change in the industry's product mix the industry has moved from product, that is the video or the film, to performance, so what the industry calls the webcam girl, a sexually explicit live performance transmitted to subscribers over the webcam. So the first is subject very easily to piracy. The second, like in many instances of live performance, is a lot more difficult to pirate effectively. Now, Cal Rostial and I at the moment are looking at another aspect of the industry. We're interested, interested not so much in its products, but in its industrial organization by which I mean who owns the pieces of the industry. So this has shifted, and we think possibly, although this is an early stage project, the shift is in response to piracy. So let me tell you a very quick story about a company that is now at least known as MindGeek. So MindGeek is a very mysterious company um, uh, that um, has received a whole lot of funding from venture capitalists, and there's a story, there's a narrative that's grown up in the industry I'm not sure how reliable it is, but I'll report the narrative to you, that MindGeek um, gained control of some tube sites, some porn tube sites of the kind that Kate described, and they flooded the market with pirated content through these porn tube sites, which drove down the value of some of the content producers which they then acquired. So what did they end up with? They ended up basically straddling two sides of the market. And um, they owned both distribution and production. And they changed the business model of the porn industry. So the porn industry used to be a relatively atomized industry with a lot of producers, a lot of distributors. It is now an industry that is much more concentrated. And where MindGeek uses the data, data that they obtain in part from tracking what's pirated on their tube sites, to produce more appealing content, which helps them to increase marginally but importantly what they call their conversion rates, that is people who visit the porn tube site and convert into paying customers for some premium service, also helps them to um, usher people into webcam areas where they pay. And by increasing their conversion rates, 
they are making money. Okay, so why do I care about this? Well, think for a moment about the music industry. And earlier, um, we talked a bit about Spotify. So why did the music industry scream so loud about piracy? In part, because of its industrial organization. If you think about the record companies, the record companies that were hurt so badly by piracy, these companies were, for the most part, pure plays. They developed artists and produced recordings. They produced the thing most easily pirated. For the most part, record companies do not own live performance venues. For the most part, record companies do not act as agents or um, as, uh, as producers of other content other than discs. And so they were very vulnerable to piracy when it came. Now, in the music industry, you might get an industrial reorganization to be more like MindGeek, where the music company, the record company, becomes not just the record company, but also the record and live performance company. What piracy takes away with records it helps grow with live performances, right? People resort to live performances. They are much more popular than they used to be. They're much more expensive than they used to be. That side of the business is growing. The combined fortunes of the companies could be much more promising, right, if the industrial organization changed. So why doesn't the industrial organization change in music? One possibility is because of copyright, right? Copyright in music is a very complicated you know, carefully drawn out system that puts certain players in a position of having certain roles and cements them in place. So the music publishers have a role into which copyright law cements them. And the record companies have a role into which copyright law cements them. And the performing rights organizations have a role into which copyright law cements them. Copyright law constructs and then solidifies an industry structure that probably made sense in a pre-piracy era and that makes relatively little sense in a post-piracy era. So is copyright law promoting progress in the music industry? No, if this is right, it's retarding progress in the music industry. It's retarding progress in the reorganization of the industry to take account of an environment conducive to piracy for which you know, we are not going back. Okay, um, so I wanna make, use this example finally to make a point about what the future ambitions of the negative space scholarship should be. First, and you know, I hope you'll all at least think about this. This scholarship should not be a niche within IP. Its central insight should essentially occupy the IP scholarship. Our field should not be IP, it should be innovation. IP should be the subfield. And we should de emphasize the idea of creativity without IP. The primary question now, when we look at a creative field, isn't whether IP is there or not, or there in part. It's whether IP plays a role in motivating and organizing creativity. And when other, whether other factors play a role, norms, market strategies, history, industrial organization, et cetera. The question for us should always be, what are the conditions for innovation in a particular field? And whether the legal regulation that applies to that field is salient and effective and whether it does good or harm to creativity. Okay, I'm gonna end there, thanks. Gordon Russell who keeps trying to Skype with all of us. <laughs> I think uh, it's actually a perfect order to go after Chris if any of you still remain interested in the subject of creativity without law at this juncture. Um, and I think to, to Chris's negative space, I may focus on the positive space of the law, and so I think sort of a neat uh, counterpoint for the end. Um, though I want to, of course, start by thanking Aaron and Kate for putting on this conference and uh, for inviting me to participate. Um, and I want to try, as I was asked to do, to provide some bigger picture perspective, interlace uh, with some observations uh, from the day. 
And also, this has been very useful because I've been asked to write as part of uh, Peter Manel and Ben DePorter's research handbook on the economics of IP law, the chapter on custom and norms, uh, including not only my work, but others, so I can now uh, update uh, my thinking with all of everybody's ideas uh, from today. Um, so as many of you know, I've written a fair amount about custom and IP law, most recently writing about how this might influence revisions and uh, reviews of copyright law. And today I'm also going to sort of skew my comments for the most part to copyright, uh, but I think they have broader uh, applicability. Um, although this conference is called Creativity Without Law, and many recent empirical projects have analyzed areas where the law either doesn't apply or is not followed or seems less influential, I think there's no question that in the area of copyright, most of these areas have actually operated in the shadows of the law and without completely independent development. And I think that makes it very different from Bob Ellickson's work uh, in Order Without Law. Nevertheless, I think a great deal can be learned from custom, which includes social norms and industry practices in the IP space, um, both in terms of what it means for innovation policy, for incentives, um, but also about the interplay of law and these norms, whether there's some good ideas to take or some things that we might need to support in terms of the norm environment or things that we might need to protect against <coughs> that emanate from industry practices and social norms. Now I have to say that as I was putting this together, I started to think back to when I first thought about custom and there was not a conference like this and there was not all this wonderful empirical work. There was just starting to be some. There was Chris and Cal's work on fashion, there was Eric Von Hippel's work on chefs. And this is what the IP of field said uh, before I started working uh, on the larger theoretical frame of custom and by people who I really respect. Chris Along said, intellectual goods are unaided by longstanding customary definitions, communal norms or widespread understandings. 2004, before that, Stephen Carter said, IP is so heavily regulated that there's less and less space for private ordering to emerge. So not only has the entire day we've spent together refuted those ideas, but even at the time they were writing, it wasn't a full picture of what was going on. So I think in terms of where the literature has shifted, we have a much more robust understanding of these negative spaces, of social norms, of industry practices. And so part of what I want to talk about today is to sort of think about how we might organize these norms and practices in a more theoretical framework. So we've talked a lot about different sorts of use communities, from tattoos to roller derbies to chefs. I'm sorry, I didn't have a cocktail slide, though it's almost cocktail hour. Um, and I want to differentiate between types of social norms and practices. And I distinguish and have in prior work between aspirational customs and those which are more practical in nature, those which are driven by litigation avoidance. So an aspirational one might be, to the extent that we could, independently develop rules about how we might use intellectual goods or how we might develop creative communities. What would we like these rules to look like? What do we think would be appropriate? And I contrast that with more practical ones, which are largely practices or norms driven by trying to avoid liability for running afoul of our existing intellectual property laws or trying to make oneself, if one's liable, uh, likely to be on the hook for a smaller amount. Um, so I want to distinguish those and classify them, as well as distinguish between informal and formal norms. So let's talk a little bit about informal but aspirational practices. So here I think of fan fiction, which is largely largely operated uh, sort of independently of formalized law, although recently there's been a lot of uptick in commercializing and selling and copyright protecting fan fiction. Uh, One Direction is a good example of that for those who followed that uh, six-figure deal on the, the uh, was it Harry Styles sex, uh, sex book. Um, of fan fiction, and chefs, right, where norms have developed, trying to come up with what are the best ways that we can sort of create in these communities and respect one another's creations. We also see more formalized but still aspirational norms. One example of this is faculty ownership of our works, which seems to potentially conflict with the formal law, but which has itself been formalized in terms of university policies and written down. 
The Creative Commons is another example where we see aspirational norms at work, uh, but in a more formalized way in which we have contract law overlaying on copyright law. So although many of these areas that I have identified are aspirational in nature, it's fair to say that they're not wholly divorced, uh, they're not wholly divorced uh, from the law, and I think it's fair to say that they operate in the shadows of the law. So just some live additions from today, right? Ariel Katz said adopting the rule, that we adopted the rules of copyright without knowing what they are, suggesting that maybe we're adopting things that are already the insights of copyright. And Aaron uh, spoke about Nichols and Campbell and that people actually said things that were almost verbatim, what we later had much more sophisticated judges writing out, which is really interesting. Um, and I think that some of that is true, that we naturally percolate up these ideas. But in another aspect, I think these communities are not fully operating outside the law, but are heavily influenced by norms um, that are already in existence. So, and some of this has been identified, but fashion designers may adopt designs specifically that can be protected by trademark law. They may shift the way in which they develop or design plans uh, because of the lack of copyright protection so that it works better in the market, which affects, which uh, echoes what Chris was saying about shifting what is in fact created. Rolly der Derby players may be shifting to trademark their names, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Chefs uh, at some point put out co co cookbooks which are copyrighted, and uh, comedians do record uh, both uh, albums, archaically digital files, which were once on albums, and, uh, and also TV specials. So they're not completely unaware of IP law, but instead are always working around, inventing around, and in the shadow of IP law, despite being these aspirational norms. Nevertheless, I think these aspirational norms can tell us quite a bit about how we might like our more formalized law to look. And I contrast that with litigation avoidance practices, which is a whole ca another category of, of practices and norms, which we haven't talked about at all today. But I think if we're going to be looking at a full ecosystem of norms, we need to look at the norms on both sides, not just the ones we really like and hope get adopted, but the ones that we really dislike and could be adopted in equal measure if we look at the way the law interacts with these practices. So I wanna briefly highlight some of these. Many of you are aware of the clearance culture practices, large studios, large publishing houses clear virtually everything, even if they don't need to, even if it's not protected by intellectual property, largely for risk-averse reasons. Uh, there's some movement away from this, but it's still fairly entrenched from what I can tell. More formalized litigation avoidance practices include things like the classroom guidelines, which were in the part of the legislative history for the 1976 Copyright Act, and paint a very narrow portrait of what educators can use as far as classroom materials without running afoul of copyright law. They were negotiated, although the word negotiated is a bit of an exaggeration, uh, with the publishing companies and the authors group uh, and no other players involved against massive opposition by university professors. Students were completely absent from the discussion. Uh, yet some courts have incorporated these classroom guidelines, these practices, as if they set ceilings rather than floors and as if they were actually codified. And as I'll talk about in a moment, the courts have also codified some of the clearance practices. At the same time, we see formalized, and I still think, litigation avoidance practices coming from the other perspective in the best practices of fair use that have been recently very popular and generated predominantly out of American University, and there are some members of this room have been involved in them. They're a very noble effort to encourage the assertion of fair use in the face of clearance culture, but do also run the same danger of of suggesting to courts that we should be codifying custom. And if we do so, which practices are gonna be incorporated? Is it gonna be a small niche community's custom or practices, or is it gonna be the major studios, major publishing companies' practices of clearing everything? So I think we need to be aware of the full ecosystem. And at the same time, as to the individual practices, there are certainly areas that some have heard me complain about before where I think they're overly narrow, particularly in the arena where I used to work in documentary filmmaking. So one axis that I want to frame is this difference between aspirational 
norms and litigation avoidance ones. And the other that I've been sort of fainting at in this discussion is the difference between de facto and de jure effects of norms and practices. So it's one thing if a given community develops its own norms, and it's quite a different if that has a spillover effect into the law. When are these practices incorporated? When should they be incorporated? And I've written a fair amount about that, and I'm, I'm going to only touch upon it here. Um, but Chris uh, Bucafusco talked about lots of us don't really like copyright law in this room. So I'll just out myself. I like copyright law. I like to teach it, and I also like the rights that it affords. Um, so the question is, which aspects of copyright law do we like? Which aspects of these norms do we like? And I think we can't just, as I said, pick and choose the ones we like. So what originally drove me to investigate custom was a case called Ringgold v. Black Entertainment Television, which involved the use of this uh, poster of this artwork on the left by Faith Ringgold in the uh, successful, though uh, now dated, uh, sitcom Rock. It never appeared for more than 30 seconds. It was not discussed in the dialogue. It was never the focal point of any shot. Nevertheless, uh, a federal court of appeals rejected a fair use defense because of the failure to follow the industry practice of clearing, I think unnecessarily, except after this case, uh, background scenery. So on the, and there are, and I have documented many, many cases which have done exactly this on the basis of custom, and it makes sense importing uh, the, the, wor the work uh, and the words from the Harper and Rowe decision by the Supreme Court, where failure to pay the customary price is a basis for disfavoring, strongly disfavoring fair use. Now, this has all sorts of circularity problems that I don't really have time to get into at the moment, but it's fair to say that custom has been used to restrict fair use, to expand copyright. So when we think in the context of all these wonderful social norms that we might prefer, we also have to recognize the way in which the courts might actually engage with custom. So what are some things that copyright laws can do in light of this broader ecosystem of norms that point in both directions, not just <coughs> those that some of us might favor? So I've thought about this in the context, as I said, in part of copyright reform, so I'll talk about it in that context, as well as how courts should think about these customs and norms. One is to leave breathing room for private ordering and experimentation and to try to let where applicable communities sort of self-regulate, particularly within the in-groups. Second, it might be worth actually codifying some of the good ideas that seem pretty uniformly accepted. Attribution or credit, if we want to distinguish them, is something that's uniformly liked. Now, it has some downsides, so we might not want to make it dispositive, but it might be something we'd want to put a thumb on the scale for, for example, in fair use analyses. Faculty ownership of our works is also uncontroversial. Why not just clear that up and codify it? I have a vested interest, <laughs> undoubtedly, but I think it's true. Um, I think there are also areas where private ordering is not as successful as it could be because of obstacles of formalized law. So an example of this is actually the Creative Commons licenses where many in the film industry, particularly independent filmmakers and documentary filmmakers who I often advise, are afraid to use Creative Commons works for fear that, by, that if they violate the license, which they may well do by distributing in a commercial manner, they will be left in a worse off position than if they had a just exerted fair use against something that didn't have a Creative Commons license because they'll look like a bad actor and if we look at customary practices and the way in which they're used and violating the norms, they may fare worse. That's an area where we might be able to use the law to codify this. Um, there might also be some ways of uh, some other areas like protecting data in the norms that we could have the copyright system work as well. Third, in terms of more formal law engagement, there may be instances in which we need to protect um, against the excesses of private ordering and customary practices, both to push against the clearance culture and not allowing sort of this sort of recursive incorporation of customary risk-averse licensing practices, but also perhaps not to uh, rigidly enforce use guidelines that weren't negotiated by a diverse or representative group, against, particularly against the out group. And we also might want to restrict the ability of private parties, particularly large content providers, to have very restrictive technology and restrictive Con, uh, restrictive contracts. And as we've already talked about this. Um, finally, when courts think about norms and practices when they analyze fair use or um, uh, analyze fair use 
or uh, think about custom in other contexts other than fair use in the IP space, there are a few considerations that I think the courts need to keep in mind. First of all, is the norm or practice certain? Is the, does the community agree about its contours? How would they describe it? Is it uniformly uh, respected? Second, was the norm developed in a representative manner? Do both content creators and users agree on this custom and follow this practice? Do both larger and smaller players in the group, uh, were they represented in its development? Third, what were the motivations behind the effort to establish, uh, to establish this pr practice? Is it just an, an effort to avoid litigation or liability, or is it an effort to figure out what would work best in the community or support their values? What would be the fair and appropriate boundaries? And obviously, to the extent that it's more aspirational in nature, I think it should be given more value. And finally, I think courts need to consider whether a slippery slope might re result from this particular practice. Is this the sort of thing, if we let everybody use it more broadly, if we extrapolated it outside the, the in-group, would all of a sudden all uses be fair game, or would everything be locked down? I think without considering all these features, no customs, no practices, no norms should be incorporated into more formal law, even if they continue to play a role uh, less formally. So as we look back on nearly a decade of robust attention to custom from me and from many people in this room in terms of social norms and, practi and practices in the context of intellectual goods, I think and, and as we celebrate this sort of flourishing of creativity without law, it's important to continue to contextualize our discussion in the framework of the interplay of law and these extra legal activities. And to consider how some use communities and creator communities that may be normatively less sympathetic to this group also operate in this space and how the IP ecosystem may be better for us understanding this interplay and how we want the practices to apply more broadly so that we can separate the wheat from the chaff. How do we determine what are the good norms and how do we, how do we determine what are the ones we want to reject without making, I think, highly problematic value judgments. So I look forward to our continued conversation on these issues this afternoon and in the future. And I will just apologize in advance, though I think we, we still have plenty of time, but around 4.30, 4.40, I'm out of here to catch a plane. So thank you. Thank you all so much, um, especially Chris, for researching this industry and taking some of the porn girl um, <laughs> labeling. Uh, no, seriously, I think, I think it's so important that people actually look into this industry and so interesting and especially people with tenure, everyone should, should be doing it. Uh, no, okay, but seriously, um, I, I really love how the panels this afternoon have been this great mixture of really interesting research, research updates, um, kind of looking at things from, from the bigger, bigger picture perspective and kind of really beautifully pulling together the parallels uh, in, in all of this, the, in this whole body of work and, and also looking at the open questions. And I really am hoping that we can continue this conversation as a room. I did wanna just privilege the panelists in case you have comments or questions for each other that we give you a few minutes to uh, do that before we open it up. I had a couple of questions. If I had one for, for Dave and one for Chris. So, um, so uh, Dave, I was thinking about the trademark, the shift to trademarking derby names, mm -hmm. and the notion that there was a norm not to do so, and how strong was that norm in terms of a value as opposed to just something that happened because people didn't really think of it and didn't interact with the law. Because I think those are very different because if it's a stronger norm against trademarking, then this is a big sea change. If it's just, wow, you know, Susie trademarked her name and that was a really good idea. I never thought of that. Right. So, I mean, the, the reasons why people didn't trademark that I observed when I wrote the paper are multiple. Part of it was that people weren't aware of it. Oftentimes people would say, yeah, I'm not going to copyright my name. It's just not necessary. And I would say, I think you mean trademark. And they would say, I think I know what I mean, right? So, I mean, maybe that means I lack gravitas on this issue or something. But that was part of it. But a lot of people were aware of it. And they said, I don't want to trademark my name because it's just too expensive, right? Relatedly, even if I did trademark my name, it wouldn't give me the thing I want, right? I don't want to haul somebody into court. What I want to do is have this informal exclusion within a subculture 
And if I said, step off my name because it's trademarked, that wouldn't have a lot of credibility, right? So it's not, I think that to some extent, people were aware that trademark existed. They didn't understand it that well. Uh, there was a, a slight undertone, if, if you ever read Ellickson on this, there's a, there's a note that in Shasta County, there's something unappealing about adverting to law. Like, you know, and I think the way he phrased it, he's like, real men solve their own disputes, right? So like real derby girls handle things privately amongst themselves. They don't, they don't go to a lawyer, right? They like talk to each other. Um, and I think what's happened isn't, isn't terribly inconsistent with any of those things. Because even when I did the initial paper, what I observed was that the tiny handful, and it was like a handful of people who were investing in a career in Derby, were cool with trademarking their name and people respected what they were doing, right? Because they weren't sending cease and desist letters to somebody with a similar name who was skating. They actually wanted to invest in a business that made it make sense for them to trademark their name, right? So, so that... I, so I, I don't think that the underlying norm has changed. I think the practice has changed within a set of pre-existing norms because of the sort of macro forces that are causing the derby world to change. It's interesting, though, because, you know, so I was a little worried at the beginning of your talk you were going to describe your views now as I got something wrong. You've actually said that at one point. So I think built into these norm stories is the possibility of change. And what I heard was, even in the beginning, was what really you ended with, which is this is a story of resilience. So what's happened is the, the, the craft has grown, right, enormously. And the, the, the uniqueness of name norm just doesn't make any sense anymore. It's just not tenable. And so a whole bunch of other things have adjusted to allow this community to continue to kind of self-regulate. Right, so what do, what do the trademarks mean? So more people are applying for trademarks now, but I think still an open question is what they mean. And there's a few elements to this. So the Dawn Donut Rule basically means that if they, even if they federally register a trademark, they're not gonna be able to oust somebody in another geographic area until they enter that geographic area. So it really depends on how much skating remotely from where they live they're going to do. So the trademark may be meaningless because of the Dawn, Dawn Donut Rule unless you get an active national circuit, right? Okay, so also abandonment. So they're gonna have to use this trademark in commerce. Either they're gonna have to file an intent to use application and use it in commerce within six months, or they're gonna have to file an actual use application and use it in commerce right away. Whether just skating around with that name means use in commerce is actually kind of a mystery to me. So if this is ever gonna be litigated, I'm not sure how that's going to come out, but it's an interesting question. And then, then the ultimate question is, well, even if they are using it in commerce, what does the trademark mean if you don't enforce it? So it can be just a notice to the world that, you know, I skate under this name and look, I have a federally registered trademark. But the, the only reason the trademark actually has any salience, more salience than having your name on the registry in the old system is if you think there's a risk of consumer confusion or the dilution of the distinctiveness of your name, and you threaten legal action or actually take legal action to remedy it. Which, if that happens, I think that would be seismic, you know, because then this, this entire set of understandings is open to question, right? And I, I don't know how it would go, but I think, I, think, I think we're all waiting to see what happens there. Yeah, so I should stress that the only people who, the, the overwhelming number of people I've seen trademarking the, marking their names are people who might actually have a plausible argument for a legitimate trademark. Like, they want to, like, Bonnie Destroyer, who skates for San Diego, wants to be a derby coach, and she has a particular style of coaching, right? So she has a business, and it is associated with her name, right? And that's a very different kind of argument than trademarking your derby name because you want to stop somebody else from skating under it, right? Um, all the iterations of trademarking I've seen seem to be associated with having commercial aspirations that make the trademark claim make sense in the traditional way we understand trademarks. And yeah, you'd have to have, uh, you know, meet the elements of a trademark claim, but I think many of these women do. And then to go back to Chris's first point, yeah, I mean, you know, one, one self-deprecating uh, joke aside, I do think this is a success story about informal norms, right? The, the, the takeaway point that I get from this is that what's appealing about informal norms as opposed to something imposed top down that's less changeable is that, you know, when a community's you know, preferences change or when outside forces require it to change, informal norms are better able to adapt with it, right? And um, I think the only puzzle that I'm left with is this paper, I'm gonna think about it more, is where the direction of causation is, right? So one observation is that people seem a lot less wound up about exclusive derby names. Is that a product of 
derby name regulation changing necessarily causing them to just react differently to them? Or is it something that preceded the change in derby name regulation itself? I don't know the answer to that. But yeah, I do think that what this means is that, you know, the, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a win for informal order in the sense that while the master roster itself changed, right, it was designed almost to change, right, because it was something informal and, you know, the thing that grew up in its place is a reflection of how things work currently, which I think is a good outcome. And they automated it and they got 15,000 entries. Yes. Since the early part of 2014. Which is kind of amazing. Yeah. But it's interesting, it also overlaps with Finmi's story about Nollywood, which is that the commercialization, it leads to the shift in an interest in more IP. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting, I don't know if you're going to follow up with this more robustly, and to be, since I teach trademarks, to be more precise, right? They don't need to do anything to have a trademark in their name as long as, right, they haven't, they don't need to register it. So I assume that you were talking about people actively registering, whether on state right. or federal registries. Um, and once they do that, they can assert, you're right, once they go into the market, uh, their rights against against the world. But but are there cases in which people are asserting it in the group and against other people, or is it just people who are going out and trying to commercialize? Because that right. would be very different, right? That would be mm -hmm. more of a sea change. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, so what, what I've seen is this. So I looked on the PTO's website, and the last time I researched this paper, there were fewer than, there were just under 10 women who had re registered their name, right? Seven of them were involved in the then new game about roller, a video game about roller derby, and two were people who had started a business, and that was it. Now there's just over 50, but every single one of them is associated in some way with a business. Usually it's coaching or equipment or something like that, right? Um, has anyone actually asserted a trademark, you know, as sort of like written a cease and desist letter to somebody else? I haven't seen it. Right? So it could just be aspirational, right? It could just be part of you develop a business. One thing you need is a brand. Part of branding is trademarking, right? That's as far as I've seen people really push it. I had a question for Chris, too. If I, can, I, I mentioned this to you earlier about the innovation and shifting to an innovation theory yeah. rather than of like the whole of all of our discipline as opposed to intellectual property. And uh, I asked you about this earlier, uh, and you had a good response, but maybe others would like to hear it, too. But um, where we fit... For those of us who are sympathetic to our, at least as to copyright, certainly, but I think patent as well, some degree of labor reward and personhood theories as an explanation and also a, to some extent a legitimate justification for the system, where that fits in the innovation. So, okay, so I've thought a lot about this and I am a utilitarian, but I recognize the value of the deontic theories, right? So the deontic theories broadly being personality-based theories. So you deserve a property right in your creativity because it reflects your personality. It's the impression of your will on the outside world. And because we respect individual autonomy, that's part of a liberal social order, we respect property rights and creative goods. So that's one. The other is the more Lockean labor value theory that, you know, I you know, we started at the beginning, if I own anything, I own my body and I own as an extension the labor of my body. And so if I mix the labor of my body with things out there in the world, I annex them to myself as property. That, that, that's a terrible theory, actually, for, for property. It's, it's a terrible theory in a whole lot of ways, but just take it as is, because I think it actually responds to a lot of intuitions about the value of labor, even if those intuitions are completely wrong. So... All right, so I'm just going to accept those, but I'm going to insist that there are two levels at which those justifications can operate. They operate at one level very well, and they fail at the second level. And the second level is very important. So the first level at which they succeed is providing a distinctive justification for why we have an IP system at all. And actually, the utilitarian justification is surprisingly weak at this top level. It's actually pretty weak at telling us why we have an IP system at all, because we don't even really know what progress is, right? We have a really, really hazy understanding of what progress is, whereas the deontic theories don't depend on a notion of progress. They depend on a sense of justice for the reward of labor or, or respect for the individual as respect for the autonomy interest in their property. Okay, so at the top level, why do we have an IP system at all? I think those deontic theories have a tremendous amount to tell us. We're lawyers, though. Okay, and so lawyers, unlike philosophers, don't just care about why we have property systems at all. They care about what property rights look like, how broad they are, how long they last, what kind of creativity they address, what kind of creativity they don't address, and what the specific exceptions and limitations are. With respect to those kind of middle and low level questions, I don't think the deontic theories have much to say for a couple of reasons. So take the, take the personality theory. 
So Kant and Hegel both recognize that creators have a personality interest in their creation, but you know what? Consumers do too. I mean, think of the way in which consumers form their personality around the things they consume. Actually, many more people form their personality around the things they consume than around the things they create. And unless you're some kind of creative snob, which I think actually a lot of artists are, and it's a, it's a characteristic of artists I really loathe, if you're, if you're not a creative snob, you, you recognize that making meaning is something that all individuals do. Some do it through creating, some do it through consuming, and the personality theory has no way of actually mediating between those two interests, even though I think those interests are both powerful. So how do we mediate between the self-creation or autonomy interests of creators and the autonomy interests of consumers, we interest balance, which is precisely what the utilitarian theory does. So the autonomy theory just breaks down into utilitarianism the minute you try to apply it in the way that lawyers would. The labor theory does too, for very one very simple reason. We have to be maximizing something with the labor theory. Now Locke says we're maximizing progress, actually. He says God wants us to be fruitful and happy. Right? So we need rules about the scope of property rights, the length of property rights that make us fruitful and happy, which means we have to, again, mediate between the interests of producers and the interests of consumers, which is precisely what interest balancing or utilitarianism or you know, our typical American approach to intellectual property is trying to do. So you know, I, I sometimes have these conversations with Europeans, and it's pretty obvious to me, and I know this sounds bad, that they haven't thought it through. And I, I just, you know, that always surprised me a little bit. And I just, I guess that's where I am on this. And so, you know, um, I know that sounds bad. <laughs> heard about the Europeans. Yeah, I'm wondering if anyone else in the room has anything to say about that or anything to say to any of the panelists or actually if anyone has any questions that they didn't get to ask earlier in the day. I think we have enough time to take a few questions now. So if you would line up at the microphones, please. So I, I laughed very much um, when you saying it hadn't been thought through because I've often had the same instinct but don't have the authority to profess you know, that sense publicly. This is an authority. This is, this is just complete lack of kind of inhibition at this point because <laughs> I've been so frustrated with this argument for so long and have been unable to understand why. So that's all. So I, I want to pose a, a, a somewhat. Uh, let me. I want to pose a question. Based earlier, you were speaking about um, about the importance of studying innovation in lieu of intellectual property, which is sort of like looking at you know studying the ends instead of the means. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, we're intellectual property lawyers. I'm fond of saying a lot in Washington that IP is just one tool in the innovation toolbox. Uh, but of course, I'm, I'm always saying that to like a room full of hammers, right? We are only one tool in the toolbox, and so we're sort of predisposed towards, towards what we know. We're not, if, if what we're trying to study is innovation, we're not really, we're not innovation lawyers, right? And so it's, it's difficult to construct um, uh, a sort of a pedagogical architecture around the ends, right? So instead, we just choose various means for getting there. I'm just wondering whether you think there's any, any sort of further you know, prescription for achieving that end. You know, that what, like how should we order our academic inquiries to, to study innovation as opposed to IP? So I think you know, th th this branch of the scholarship has done a pretty credible job of starting that, right? So the, 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 the core realization being you know, the questions are really about innovation. And IP has a role to play often, but not always. Sometimes the role that IP plays is not the role that you would think it does, right? So, so with that basic realization in mind, which I think the first 10 years or so of this scholarship has accomplished, and you know, I, I'm really happy about that, um, law schools should start thinking, for example, about the message we send to our students. So you know, at NYU, we have a big IP group, right? And we call ourselves the IP group. I'm not super happy about that. We also have an Engelberg Center on in Innovation Law and Policy. I'm much happier about that. I think that's a better name. So if we were not the IP group, but we were the Innovation Law and Policy group, I think it would be better. And then in terms of like what would we do, I think we'd continue to teach courses in copyright law, patent law, et cetera. But mixed into those courses would be just a different framing, which is this is a set of tools, tools that have been entrusted to lawyers. But these are not the only tools, and we should work 
carefully with scientists and with anthropologists and you know with with people who think about sociologists people who think about these things to uncover all the conditions that are conducive to or repressive of innovation and attempt to sort out innovation policy in a more catholic way so that that's like that it's attitudinal but i think that attitude actually catches on because actually i think just for what it's worth so look at our field okay 25 years ago compared to our field now. 25 years ago, our field was very boring. It was like a little crowd of people talking to each other about doctrine. Now our field is super interesting, right? It's a big crowd of people talking to each other about innovation. So, you know, why would we ever want to go back? So you would have to exclude trademark and right of publicity from your frame? No, because I think that trademark is very innovation producing. I haven't yet seen the argument for right of publicity that convinces me, but I think trademark actually produces a lot of innovation. So here's how. So, you know, we have a pharmaceutical that's patented. Patented runs out in 20 years. But, but ibuprofen is a great example. So patent and ibuprofen ran out in like two years after it got introduced into the United States. But Advil, which you know is the most famous branded ibuprofen, still enjoys over 50% of the market, although it's three times per pill the price of generic ibuprofen. Why is that? The power of the brand, right? So what brands give the owner of Advil is a, is a pretty reliable and potentially perpetual source of market power. That if, if For any business person who isn't like a lawyer and is thinking more you know, I think actually more holistically, the business person is thinking that's that's like an incentive to innovate, right? Or a disincentive. Or a disincentive, <laughs> depending on, right, the disincentive for the owners of that pill to innovate or further. Or for but, consumers also. Yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, we have the same set of questions, I think, that trademark pushes toward us. So, um, a comment and a question. So in defense of my Euro many of my European colleagues, um, <laughs> I think what they see is the kind of is what they view as the arrogance in some American scholars of thinking that one can rationally determine utility. That the idea that the model of human behavior that is being used is so wrong. I, I, I think it's what drives some of them. They, they cannot find a way to map the rational actor idea that comes out of utilitarianism to what they see as the actual behavior of people on the ground and individuals and communities. And I think that feeds into what we are talking about, right? That we are trying to get away from purely sort of economic motivations when we think about utility and welfare and talk about other things. And that brings us a lot closer to, right, you know, honor and reputation, which the Europeans get perfectly fine. And so I think that's the thing we have to find a way to explain um, if we are to make that link between the two. The broader question I have is this question of, if we are looking at these communities, right, these norm communities, and we are looking about what happens when they encounter uh, the desire of codification or judicialization, when somebody either the boundary comes out and says to the, to the courts, please let me do this, or I want to do this with this and it may be counter to the norms, what doctrine do we have that would allow the courts to say, okay, we will not make a decision here? One of the areas you noted was fair use is maybe one of the ways in which the courts could use to stay, stay out of it, but is that a complete explanation or complete doctrinal way for the courts to stay out of the norms and let them develop, or are there other doctrines that the courts could used to allow them to say, we're not going to get into this right now. Yeah, so it depends on the, it depends on the area of law. But in copyright, the, the main way is through fair use. There are a few other smaller ways, maybe when we think about statutory damages or you know, willful conduct. But, but fair use is the main one. And before fair use was codified at common law, fair use was considered a use that's both reasonable and customary. So it looked at what was customary, but it also had this piece of reasonableness. So in my writing, I sort of say we, we kept the custom piece, but we got rid of the reasonableness piece. Um, but, but also, in, if you look at the body of case law, the customs that courts look at in fair use adjudications in copyright are largely use restrictive practices. They do not rely on, on, on practices that are more generous towards users. So that's problematic in sort of in terms of its unidirectionality. 
Um, but that's, so fair use and copyright is the main way. In trademark law, it may be more useful actually to look at customary practices because they're not really being used for their normative value. It's just our consumers likely to be confused right. because they think that this use, particular use is commonly licensed or commonly done this way. And so that's a very different and I think at least less normatively problematic, although it still has this circularity problem, which is that if we have risk averse licensing because people are afraid of being sued and then people think everything needs to be licensed, then they're going to be confused, of course, if something isn't licensed, but that's a separate problem. In the patent, it's been a long time since I've thought about patent uh, in this context, um, uh, but, but I did write a little bit about it. It comes up in terms of, and there are others in the room uh, that, that may be more qualified to answer, but, but I, I know it came up in terms of sort of reasonable licensing fees. Um, it comes up also a little bit in terms of um, uh, sort of uh, in determinations, of course, it would come up, I think, in determinations of prior art, though. I didn't talk very much about that, but Kathy might, might have more in terms of opening up, yeah, not well, to put I you on the spot. Yeah, you can. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I enlisted her, but it's, yes. Yeah. So if, if it's in response to that, then please speak to the line. Okay. Um, I actually thought I was in the line, but. Um, so just as re in response to that, yeah, we're, we have problems with this with patent law, despite some of our efforts to argue that there should be fair use in patent law. Um, we have, you know, research exemption. Um, one place where we might be starting to see some of this, actually, um, and this is something I'm uh, writing about now, is in the patentable subject matter area. I think some of what is going on there um, even though it's not quite acknowledged that that's what's going on, is uh, delineating, um, say, for example, uh, between this is an area we're going to let scientific norms deal with, and this is an area we're going to have, or um, medical norms, this is an area where we're going to have patent. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's, it's less, because um, we don't have fair use, we have less, less scope for that. So. So, uh, I have a question for Chris and Dave, but first just a plus one to Chris's point about the innovation as the end product and sort of the in, you know, sort of rhetorical strategies in education to sort of implement that. So you can, you know, you can rename things. Um, so I've shifted our IP concentration to an innovation concentration within the curriculum. Um, I actually had a student comment on my copyright law class at the end of last semester whose student said for the first time ever, I know you do all this work on commons and common strategy, but you didn't talk at all about that during the class itself. Uh, and this was not a seminar, this was just a regular copyright. So I'm going to restructure my syllabus a little bit and be a little bit more flexible in terms of how the copyright stuff fits in. Here's the question, um, or maybe just sort of ask an invitation to reflect. So Chris, you made the point that we should be thinking hard about industrial structure in sort of in general and, and sort of changes to industrial structure over time, which I think is really, really uh, an important point. So that was interesting to reflect in the context of Dave's description of the shift in the roller derby world because one way to interpret what's going on is a shift from a more craft-based context to something that more resembles an industrial style of production. And so I wonder if that's a, a reasonable line to look for in a broader sense in the evolution of these sort of norm-based slash somewhat IP-based domains. Right, so I mean, I, I, I see the dividing line differently. I mean, I think this is just about scale, right? And I think that the reason that the you know, conception of what derby names mean and how they're governed changed is just that a certain vision of what people wanted, which is exclusivity, was not tenable when things got international and past a certain, you know, order of magnitude, right? I, I think a, a sort of ancillary driver of it, though, is, is this notion that there's something is changing from a community activity to, uh, you know, extracurricular that has this strong desire for professionalism that's underlying it, right? But I think those two things push in the same direction, right? So like with a lot of causation stories, it's kind of hard to disentangle them. Um, if I were just guessing, I think the first one is sort of the primary driver and the second one is the secondary driver, but they're both certainly present in different ways. And then I think another important distinction is the, the, the system I'm describing isn't quite the same as a lot of the other systems that people have talked about. Because I'm talking about a system of regulating exclusivity or providing coordination in the context of creativity that people have already come up with. It's never, it was never meant to be an incentive. It was just meant to be uh, not, not even a reward, right? But just something that managed people's pre-existing creation, as opposed to some of the other you know, 
case studies which sort of investigate the question of how creativity arises in the absence of the traditional IP style incentive, right? That's kind of a question that I never really engage because it's not relevant to the master roster. I, I don't think it's an industrial organization either. I think it might be, you know, th there are large industries that are organized with less IP. And if it's, if it's a norms story, um, it would have to be that the norms are powerfully efficient for the producers. If it's a market story, there could be a relative absence of norms, like in the fashion industry, where what actually what actually holds together the dynamic in the fashion industry is really just the market and the way that fashion goods are consumed. They're consumed inside of trends, right? So copying is one element of the trend cycle. So you know, it, it, I think these these examples are all different. Could I just say one thing about the question about? Um, you know, I, I've heard people react to the kind of utilitarian perspective on intellectual property in a way that says, well, this is all economic theory, and economic theory misses a lot of human values. I actually think that's wrong, and I think it's wrong in a kind of funny way. So um, that may have been right in like 1982 if you were at the University of Chicago. It's actually not right now, in part because economic theory in innovation studies has expanded way beyond the rational actor model into observational studies like Mako's and into behavioral economics experiments like mine with Chris Bacafusco, where the rational actor model is, you know, actually not simply not the model, but is actually questioned, right? So these, these models of law and economics take into account or attempt to take into account dignitary interests and you know individual idiosyncrasies and cognitive biases and all the things that make human uh, character interesting and fun right the, the the critique that says well this is all about like a theory is funny coming from people who are basically wedded to either labor or dignitary theory because those are purely theories and they're theories that are much more complicated when they're applied in this context I mean think of creative works creative works are good but they're also bad. Why are they bad? Because they're impositions on our cognition. They, I didn't ask for Disney to impose that Frozen movie on me. And in fact, I resent them imposing that Frozen movie on me. That occupies a part of my mental space that I wish were not occupied by that thing. And really, so I should have a dignitary interest in being able to use the culture that is imposed on me and to push back against it. Right. So how like human dignity works out in the context of IP is a really complicated question that can't be answered theoretically. And the people who complain about economic theory and then try to replace it with some dignitary theory are just kind of like full of it. I, I have to agree with, I mean, disagree with you on that, Chris, because I, I think that there's a, a faith, and I, I, I think the economic point was a different one, not the rational actor critique, which is a fair critique, though I agree behavioral economics has moved beyond it, but that you can't actually quantify. You can do, you know, tests till the cows come home, but you're not going to be able to figure out the perfect duration or scope of copyright law or the perfect duration or, uh, or the perfect scope of fair use or any of these, these IP products. You're not going to get it perfect by getting all that information. I think that you can put together, and I'm just more of sort of a pluralist about all this. Like, I think that there is a utilitarian component, there's a dignitary component, and I think that the dignitary component is something that's telling. Certainly, like, you know, you probably didn't like my piece on that subject, but, no, right, I mean, but, I did but, like but, but, but that yeah. I think that, I, I think that you can compare interests in, in, in a sort of, a, you can cross-pollinate between these. And so I think you can investigate the dignitary interests of a user uh, in understanding that there's also dignitary interests of the author and then think, well, what will effect will that have on innovation, which is a utilitarian question, totally. right? But it incorporates the dig dignity. And I think you have to do that all with the frame that you're never going to get it exactly right and you're never going to be able to quantify and it. And here's where I don't think we disagree. So what you did in that article and what you just said now is to import dignity as a value into a utilitarian construct. It is no longer a deontic construct when you do that. It's, it's a value that you're importing into utility, which I'm totally fine with. What, I, what I'm not fine with is the idea that there is some purely deontic approach to this that goes anywhere beyond just should we have the system at all. That's, that's I think, the nature of the, the disagreement. And if I, I could add just one thing to this, I think the comment came from a suggestion that maybe there's a difference in the way people think about IP at a ground level, maybe in Europe and America.
But I think that might be a misconception. I mean, my casual empiricism is that the, the, the concerns you describe that people might have in Europe to the act of infringement, if I'm an owner of, of a, a copyrighted work of authorship, in terms of honor and violation and transgression, those are the same moral intuitions I think people have regardless of where they happen to live. I think the distinction, though, is that merely because people have a set of moral intuitions in response to infringement doesn't mean those moral intuitions need to form the foundation of a system of copyright that is designed to promote innovation, right? I think that a system designed to promote innovation might do well to capture some of those intuitions, but I don't think that means that it has to mirror how people instinctively feel when they experience transgression of an intellectual property right. So I have two unrelated thoughts. Um, and the first is for, uh, for Dave. Um, and uh, I, it's, a, it's a tweak on what you said. Uh, which uh, sort of echoes a little bit of what Chris said and, and then goes farther. I think you, uh, you, you, you took an intentionally humble approach to, uh, to your topic by saying uh, that it's about the decline of a private ordering system. And I actually think it, was, it would probably be more useful if framed as the transformation of a private ordering system um, because uh, because it's not, it hasn't collapsed, it's just changed. The things that this community values most have changed. They valued slightly different things and they have a system that reflects that now, uh, which has a slightly larger component of, uh, of formal law, but not, still not huge. Um, so, and I, the reason I think that's valuable is I think it undermines the, uh, what I think uh, Rochelle Cooper-Dreyfus uh, voice back in 2006, which, which was that low IQ, IP equilibria are fragile. Um, and I've always kind of resisted that idea because I don't think they are. And this is, a good, this is good evidence that they're not, that they're actually quite flexible. They're fragile if we think of them as static, but they're dynamic. So I, that's more a comment than anything else, but I think it's a nice way of framing what you did. Yeah, so I mean, it was it was partly because it was Halloween and partly because I actually mean this. Like, the death tarot card is exactly the metaphor that I think of when I was thinking about this presentation, right? In one sense, but in one sense, there very much has been a decline and, and sort of a form of failure. Like, the master roster stopped working. People don't use it. Nobody submits to it anymore. The person who was the registrar gave up, right? So there is something that looks like decline, right? But like, and perhaps I didn't emphasize this enough, but what I think it is is a success story about a, a system of informal order that transcended the particular registry that I happened to write the paper about, right? And so that's, that's what I think the overall takeaway is. And I think I need to revisit, um, you know, this sort of low IP, um, you know, being fragile argument, right? But I mean, it depends on what the thing is that is the object of fragility, right? A particular registry may be fragile, but the, the idea of informal uh, regulation itself obviously has the advantage of, um, flexibility for the very reason that there's no central authority demanding that we insist on it, even when it's become this like ossified ghost ship bureaucracy that's no longer necessary. Uh, the other is a, is a, is a bit of a, a defense of the uh, deontic theories. Um, <laughs> ha having written uh, a, an article with the title, IP's negative space beyond the utilitarian, I feel it's my duty to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think that, uh, and this is, along the lines of what Jennifer was saying, I think uh, that there's room for, uh, for coexistence uh, without just folding the deontic theories, in, without making them sort of ontic, right? <laughs> um, without folding them into utilitarianism. And that is to say, they c because they represent moral intuitions, they can actually do a good bit to tell us what norms look like, what norms represent, and why we have them. And it goes along, I think, a little bit with what I was asking today about what is produced, right? One of the things that's produced is stuff. But there may be other things that are produced in creative communities like joy or community. Um, and those uh, you could just say, well, that's all the utility, it's non-economic, but it's a non-economic utilitarian analysis and we're done. Uh, or you could say that they reflect people's moral values of what they think is 
just in the form in the Lockean sense, or what they think is self-actualizing in the in the Hegelian sense, and uh, and stop there, uh, and just say this helps us understand what's happening in these norms communities, um, and I think that's not useless. So let me just give you a question that highlights my difficulty with the interaction between deontic and utilitarian theory. So in trademark, we have two types of fair use doctrine, right? Nominative and descriptive. So take nominative fair use for a second. So, you know, I, I want to be able to kind of push back against the political content of the trademark, right? I want to be able to essentially um, be hostile to the trademark. So there are dignitary interests that the trademark holder has in having the message that he's sending to the world be respected. And there are dignitary interests that I have in basically being able to push back against that message. And without resorting to utilitarianism for a moment, how does deontic theory tell us what the right scope of fair use in that instance is? Is the trademark holder Procter & Gamble? Also, we make a distinction between natural and legal. We actually yeah. don't. Well, I mean, not here. Okay, so now the trademark holder is me. I'm not Procter and Gamble, right? So now what? Like, you know, I have a, I have a specific like I'm a doctor and I do a certain kind of procedure, and you know, the the, the patient of mine thinks my procedure sucks, and he wants to have a website that says drsprigmansucks.com, right? So what what are how do we adjust the rights here? Does it? Does it help to say that I'm looking at the deontic theories as explanatory rather than instrumental? Well, we're lawyers, so instrument is what we care about because we have to, oh, we have to draft legal that, rules. I, that's yeah. not clear. Right. That's what you yeah. care about. Yeah. It's yeah. not necessarily what I care about. I hear you. I hear you. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm speaking as a lawyer. I spend a lot of time as a lawyer. I'm just speaking as a lawyer. But Larry Tolkien has some great papers on this, right? This is, this is the battle between of rights. Yeah. Yeah. The rights tell this all the time. But it's how do we balance the rights? It's not an instrumental. No, 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 I get that. And so I spent a year working on the South African Supreme Court as a clerk, well, yeah. and they have a limitations clause. So here's how they do it. X has a right, Y has a right. These rights conflict, so they've got to rank them. There is no way of ranking rights other than what the judge prefers. And that's what I don't like. Deontic theories come down to what the theorist prefers. There is no external point of validity. It's just what the theorist prefers. I don't like it. I don't think it's good for the law. I don't think it's a valuable way of making legal rules. So I think we need another day yeah. uh, to, to resolve uh, all of these things. I was going to ask a question. I don't have time to ask a question. I have a comment for, for Dave, and it's less a comment for Dave as it is a comment about Dave. Um, when, <laughs> when, when, I, when I asked Dave to come and talk today, he said, I'm happy to come. It sounds great. I will show up as long as you don't make me talk about roller derby. <laughs> and I'm glad that uh, external forces conspired to make you uh, revisit this topic because I agree that like the 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 points where the norms break down the points is uh, the points where as Mike pointed out um, we see conflict between the in group and the out group you see um, those tensions I think reveal a lot more about what matters in these communities than like the sort of smooth operation of the norms um, and so I, this update I think is really wonderful thanks I'm reminded of the the thing that I think the Albertino character said in Godfather 3 just when I thought I was out you pulled me back in <laughs> on that note uh, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for being here today I thought it was a really great day I hope you agree with me um, as Aaron mentioned this morning the impetus uh, for this event is a book that we've been working on called Creativity Without Law that a bunch of you are contributing to. And hopefully the rest of you will contribute to volume two. No, we don't know if there will be a volume two. But uh, I do know that if the first book is half as interesting as today was, that I will be very happy. So thank you all again. I hope that we can continue these conversations and some of you will be able to continue them over drinks because I hear there is reception that I did not know about previously. I don't think it's on the schedule, but maybe you could give uh, us the details. If we walk out this door, uh, we should stumble upon some sort of reception. That's all I know. <laughs>